All right, welcome to our literary analysis paper. This is your guide to writing a literary analysis. The materials that I used in order to compile this lecture come from an adaptation for a guide to writing a literary analysis and also um, from the Owl Purdue Online Writing Lab website. Both of those websites are uh, listed below and you can access them at any time for further information. We're going to begin with a definition of a literary analysis. And we're first going to talk about what an analysis is not. An analysis is not an evaluation. When you think about an evaluation of a movie, for instance, if you go see a movie and people say, well, how was it? You evaluate it and you say, well, eh, not so good or, well, it could have had more action. We're not talking about evaluation when we're talking about the literary analysis. We're talking about interpreting the literature. And that means we're going to dive in to what the deeper meaning is and we're going to talk about how the author or how the piece communicates best that deeper meaning and then we're going to present an argument or uh, make an opinion statement and we're going to support that argument or that opinion statement with terms that we have used for many years throughout our school career we're going to access literary devices such as plot setting point of view, first person, second person, etc. Characterization, uh, flat characters, round characters, dynamic and static, symbols, metaphors, uh, different types of, of genres, and also even irony. So all of these literary devices that you have been using all these years and saying, oh, there's a symbol or I spot a metaphor are great, except for now you're going to start using them as tools for um, to support your opinion about what you think the deeper meaning of the piece could be. So these are, again, things you've been doing, um, finding all throughout your school career, and now we're just going to employ them in different ways. Now, you might ask, what's the purpose of this? Why would we spend so much time picking apart and dissecting a piece of literature? Won't that ruin it? The answer is no, not if you do it correctly. In fact, if you do it correctly, you're actually going to hopefully mine out a deeper and more meaningful and richer understanding of the piece and the meaning, um, the theme in the literature. The other thing that uh, that a literary analysis paper can help you to do is we can actually sort of use it as a tool for a persuasive essay. So um, that literary analysis paper can help you to create a very clear and cohesive argument or discussion using the evidence and the support all those literary devices that we talked about to back up your main point. There's a reason that a lot of lawyers get an English degree as their undergraduate degree because literature, rich, good literature is going to lend itself to um, all of those kinds of deeper, insightful discussions and explorations. Now we're going to start with the introduction, which is usually the most difficult place to get started because it's the beginning and how do you get your, your bearings. Well, I'm going to give you a, four, a list of four things that an introduction has, and then I'm going to break each one of those down. First, you've always heard of the hook. You need a hook in your introduction. It's a way to get your reader into your paper, and they can be cheesy and they can be silly. Uh, we're going to try to make them meaningful hooks. Next, we need to make sure that we mention the author and the title of the piece, as well as essential background information. And what we mean by that is basically um, plot synopsis, very brief plot synopsis, granted, but definitely some plot synopsis. And lastly, we need to provide our argument. Now, if you've written a research paper or a persuasive essay paper before, you know what a thesis statement is. In a literary analysis, your thesis statement is going to be in whole or in part, your theme. And your theme is the main message of the piece. What did you get out of the piece? And if it's a strong, rich piece of literature, it's probably going to have multiple themes. So you get to pick and choose which one you want to talk about. We're going to start with hooks. I'm going to give you four example of hook, examples of hooks. And before I do this, um, all of the examples that I'm going to use in this lecture come from a novel by William Golding called The Lord of the Flies. I will give you a brief synopsis so that you can understand perhaps where I'm coming from with some of these examples. Basically, the story is about a group of young schoolboys from Great Britain from ages between about 8 and 13 who are on an airplane and somehow the airplane crashes onto this desert island or this deserted island. All of the adults die and the children, the boys, are left to sort of rebuild society. And so it's an examination, really a social examination and a psychological one of how mankind or humanity reacts under stressful situations and also how we 
originated with our first societies and the development of that. It also explores the deep psychology of man and humanity and, and why we act the way that we do. So that's kind of an idea of what all of these examples will be coming from. So we're going to start with the type of hook that we call a startling fact, as you can imagine that society kind of at war with each other and, and trying to develop and grow and emerge is certainly going to lend itself to some startling facts. So we're going to start with um, this startling fact that I found. Nearly 60 million people died during World War II, a number which includes both battle deaths and civilian casualties. William Golding, author of The Lord of the Flies, faced the evils of humanity firsthand as a soldier in World War II. And in his novel, he explores the depths of human depravity. Now, those are two pretty long sentences. Let's, let's break them down very briefly here. You'll notice that the first is my fact. And you'll also notice that I've cited my fact. That brain, I didn't pull that fact out of my brain. I actually went and researched and found it. And it didn't really take me all that long um, once I realized what direction I was going. So I've cited my source. Not only do I need to do it here, but I also need to do it in a works cited entry at the end of the paper. Also, you notice that I've mentioned in the second sentence the author and the title of the piece. And then I have connected this startling fact with the actual events in the novel. I have two sentences, a good two sentence start. I might do another one or two sentences of plot synopsis that are related to this um, whole purpose of my paper. And then I'm going to end my introduction with my thesis statement, my theme statement. Now, by the time I've added that, that all up, I have maybe four or five sentences, strong, strong sentences. And that's a great beginning. That's a great introduction to a piece. All right, let's look at a different kind of hook. Um, this one's called a meaningful quotation. Don't just go out and choose any old quotation. It has to have some meaning to the main point of your piece. This is the one I chose. Um, it's a Nietzsche quote. Man is the cruelest animal. In William Golding's novel, Lord of the Flies, evil comes in many forms. And surprisingly, children represent the latent evil in all humanity. Now, you can guess that my paper is going to be about... Um, the goodness or the evilness of humanity. And so it's kind of a deep topic, so I want a nice meaningful quotation there. Again, I'm going to give a couple of um, descriptions of the books, a couple of short plot synopsis sentences, and then I'm going to end with a thesis. And again, I have a strong, strong introductory paragraph. All right, two more types of hooks. This one's called rich description. I like this one because it really brings your reader into your paper. It, it Oftentimes, if you do a nice description of imagery, paint a nice picture for your audience, um, it gets the, your audience hooked. This one starts out with rich tropical forests, sandy beaches, waterfalls, wild pigs, and wild boys make up the setting for William Golding's Lord of the Flies. I have only one sentence here, but you notice this really pulls you in, and it takes a turn then, because, you know, I'm thinking, oh, I'm getting, I'm hearing the sound of the tropical birds, and I'm feeling the humidity of the tropical forests, and I'm looking at the sandy beaches against the wonderful blue water, and then all of a sudden it says wild pigs and wild boys, so first of all, it sucks me in with the imagery, and then the um, kind of paradox throws me for a loop as well, and you have me hooked, I'm ready to go, I want to see what you're going to write about. The last hook I have here, and again, you can find a lot more hooks, but I'm just giving you four, is this kind of overall universal idea, which is certainly going to connect to a theme in many respects. Here's my example. For centuries, philosophers have debated the question of whether man is innately evil. William Golding poses this question in his realistic novel, Lord of the Flies. Again, two sentences this time, and I'm going to give a couple of plot synopsis sentences and my thesis, and I'm good to go. Okay, that's hooks. Let's move on to the next part of a an introductory paragraph, and that is the thesis. Now, what is the point of the thesis? As we said before, it is your opinion, and it's going to tell me what you're going to discuss in your essay. In a literary analysis, your thesis should do a couple of things. It should obviously relate to or mention and mention the theme of the work, the big idea that you are going to talk about. And it is also going to give me an idea of how you are going to support that theme. So let's look at an example. The boy's evolving relationship with the conch shell illustrates Golding's theme that humans, when removed from the pressures of civilized authority, will become evil. 
that is what your entire paper is going to be focused on. Let's look at this and break it down a little bit more. Notice how the literary device, the literary element that I'm going to use when I'm writing this whole paper, I've very much narrowed down my focus, and I'm just going to be talking about the conch shell as a symbol. If you've never seen a conch shell, it's that one that if you if you blow on the end of it, it can make a nice, great sound, hollowing sound. And that is a very strong symbol in the novel. I've decided I can use that symbol to discuss this bigger idea, this theme, that humans, when removed from the pressures of civilized authority, will become evil. And that's our theme. And now you see I have the two pieces here, theme and how the author or how the piece itself reveals or communicates the theme. All right, need a break? Let's start. Uh, get up, dance around a little bit. We want to make sure that you are uh, not getting too bored. This can take a lot of out of you. So get up. Do a little dance party. Enjoy yourself. Okay, that's enough of that. Okay, moving on to uh, our body paragraphs. This is basically the main meat of our essay. Um, your body paragraphs have a number of functions, uh, but their main function is to support the theme. And how you support the theme is you use hard evidence from the literature. I'm going to also call this textual evidence, and that's a really big fancy term that just means I'm using quotes, evidence from the text or the piece that you are studying. A uh, body paragraph should include a number of things. Again, as with the introductory paragraph, I'm going to break these down for you. A body paragraph should include a topic sentence, and we'll break that down in just a moment. It should also, as I said before, include textual evidence, and I'm going to go with, say, three nice, solid pieces of textual evidence, and with these elements that we will break down in a moment. And it also finally should include a concluding sentence. So these are the elements that every body paragraph should possess. If your body paragraph does not have these elements, it is an incomplete body paragraph. All right, let's break it down. Topic sentence. First of all, the topic sentence is going to identify the main support of your thesis. Remember what our thesis is. It's about the conch shell and how it ultimately is a symbol of humanity's evil. Now, specifically, um, your topic sentence is going to also talk about what your body paragraph is going to focus on. So let's look at this example and see how it fits both of those criteria. In the beginning, the boys view the conch as an important symbol that unites them and gives them the power to deal with their difficult situation. Okay, first of all, does it connect to the main idea, our main thesis of our paper that we put at the end of our introduction? Yes, it talks about the conch shell as a symbol. Okay, now specifically, does it talk about what this body paragraph is going to focus on? Yes, it's going to focus on initially how the conch shell unites them. Now we can probably guess by looking at our thesis that that conch shell's symbolic value is going to evolve and change. It's going to start out being a unifying symbol and it's going to evolve and degrade over the course of the novel to turn into something that actually represents all that's wrong with humanity. So we can guess that each one of our body paragraphs is going to be a little different angle on the conch shell. And that is a conch shell if you don't know what that looks like. Okay, so what, how do we support this main focus of our body paragraph? Well, we use support, we use textual evidence, as I said before. And what that is, it is work, example from the work that supports your topic sentence and also your thesis. It can be a quote, a paraphrase, or a reference to something that occurred in the text, or both. Here's a, a really short, simple example of a piece of textual evidence that doesn't require a whole lot of explanation. When the boys first find the conch, they use its beckoning call to bring everyone together. Okay, that supports the particular body paragraph that we are focusing on, the first body paragraph. It's textual support. We can say, hey, this happened in the novel. It supports my point. When we use quotes, however, we need to lead into them or what I'd like to call embed them, really put them into the piece and make them work together cohesively. And embedding a quote or lead into a quote is a phrase, could be just part of a sentence or a full sentence, that sets the reader up 
for your evidence. It, it helps me get my bearings as a reader. It perhaps might tell me who the speaker of the quote is, what's the specific situation, or even what the setting is, so that you're not just throwing the quote in there. You're helping me work that quote through and let me letting me know what that quote's purpose is. So, here's an example of a lead-in. After the boys vote, they exclaim. That's it. You can see that's just a phrase. And here's the quote. Him with the shell. Ralph, Ralph, let him be the chief with the trumpet thing. So, it's a very easy, you know, way we smoothly lead into this. And you notice that the quote and the lead-in all work grammatically in the same sentence. So, basically, if I took the quotation marks out of this sentence, it would still read, as a sentence, then that is one very important element for embedding your quotes. Okay, so after we've led into our quote or embedded our quote, the next and probably the most important part of your literary analysis is your commentary because that's your voice. That's not just throwing in an author's quote. That's you telling us how that quote is used, how the quote is analyzed, how you are interpreting the textual evidence. It basically tells your audience how your evidence supports your topic sentence and ultimately your thesis. Now, a little hint here, you should have twice as much commentary on your quote or your textual evidence as you do textual evidence. So if you have one piece of textual evidence or one quote, you should probably have two sentences of commentary explaining how and why it supports your point. Here's an example. Because Ralph possesses the conch, a symbol of power and authority, the boys choose him as their chief. The conch calls call serves as a gathering sound and brings the boys together as a society. That is an example of support. Now you can imagine in a body paragraph if you have the embedded quote, then you have a couple of sentences where you discuss it. You could have six, nine sentences at least in a body paragraph if you know you really put the um, quality of discussion into it. Now, one thing we sometimes forget when we're writing these papers because we just want to throw facts in here is we need to smoothly grow our paper and connect it together. And we do that by using transitions. And transitions are simply words or phrases that hook one idea to the next. We often think of them as words that connect paragraphs together, but I want you to also think of them as words that connect sentences together as well because that's really when you get your cohesive meaning. You can use connecting words that you probably used before in your lifetime of writing so far, like words like, such as thus and next and first and second. Those are fine, but let's up the level of sophistication in our writing and let's try to use some words that we already are using in our discussion as part of our topic, words and synonyms that are key to our discussion. So an example might be we could say finally in the climax. We could say another example of power is, and this, this would definitely be an example of connecting two sentences together. Notice how I'm using the word power, and we could use the word authority, um, we could use the word humanity. All of those words are connecting words that are related to our topic for this paper. In contrast to the rebellious behavior later in the story, these are all ways to connect our ideas together using transitions. All right, the last sentence in your body paragraph, each of your body paragraphs, should be a concluding sentence. And what that does is it ties together really all of the evidence that you've presented, and it makes that connection back to the thesis. Your reader should never forget what your main point is, that main thesis that you talked about at the very beginning in the end of your introduction. I should never lose track of where you're coming from there. And it also can include a clincher or a closing idea. Here's an example of how I might conclude this first body paragraph that we have been referencing. Thus, at first, the conch is an important object bringing civilizing influences to the boys as they work together to make the best of a bad situation. So again, we're connecting to the main thesis with the conch being a symbol and having something to do with civilization. And in this first body paragraph, the conch is still sort of working for good. And as again, as we talked about, we're going to expect to see that kind of develop throughout the course of the paper.
Now, the next two body paragraphs we won't go into, but you can guess that we, again, develop throughout the course. And so we land at the end of our paper, and we need to write a concluding paragraph. Maybe we have two, maybe we have three, maybe we have four body paragraphs. Um, but now we're done, and we need to finish our essay. So the concluding paragraph is the last paragraph in the essay. We begin by restating the thesis of the paper, what you talked about in the very beginning in the introduction we need to repeat that but don't repeat the words exactly so i'm going to visit it again by kind of rewording it and in this example i say the narrative uses the conch shell to show the slow side of the boys uh, into savagery thereby exemplifying the theme that humans have the capacity to turn evil there's the conch shell talking about it being representative of something a symbol of something and then this theme which is very, very important because we're going to be addressing that throughout the course of the writing. Now, what else do we need to put in our concluding paragraph? That's always a difficult question. Well, we can start by thinking of broadening our discussion so that we have more of this so what approach. You know, I might read this and go, well, so what? So what that the conch shell shows this? What am I, what's my takeaway? What am I going to walk away from this thinking, hmm, this gives me something to ponder. So I'm going to connect it to something more universal, something that is more relatable for a lot of people. I can do that by um, taking a number of approaches. I can reflect on how the essay relates to the book as a whole. Obviously, we've taken a, taken a very narrowed and focused look of, at the novel, which is what we should be doing. But now maybe we can branch out a little bit, connect to some of the other bigger ideas in the novel still relating to what we talked about. I can make predictions um, that are maybe relevant in the world today. I can connect back to that one of those creative openings. Uh, the first one we talked about was World War II. Is there a way that I can connect back to the way that societies fight? And certainly in uh, the book, there are factions who are warring against each other. So I could definitely connect back to that in some way. And when you do that, it really gives your, if you do it the right way, it really gives your essay a great full circle feel. Lastly, perhaps I might comment on the novel's message or the, the value or significance that the message might have for us today as a society or for me today um, as an individual. Here's an example of what that could look like. Ultimately, the narrative answers the age-old debate regarding man's innate propensity for evil. Lord of the Flies answers the question with a resounding yes. Mankind, at its basest level, can when facing extreme conditions, revert to instinctual and even evil behavior. And if you end on something like that, you've really given your reader the one-two punch, you've made it interesting, you've given us something to think about, and you have a rich discussion of a piece of literature that really lends itself to rich discussion. Now, just some closing ideas, um, some not to forget items. First of all, I want to again say to always cite your sources. You're definitely going to have one works cited entry in your paper, and that is going to be your um, novel, the novel itself. And um, so you're going to need to have parenthetical citations in the paper when you use quotes, but you're also going to need to have at least one works cited entry. And if you do just a titch of research and you find out a little bit about about something so that you can hook us into or give us a quotation to get us into your paper, you might indeed have another works cited entry as well. Another thing to remember when writing about literature is to always use the present tense. And maybe that's a really good thing to think about when you're going back through and editing and evaluating your paper after you've written it. Catch all those little present tense errors. And then finally, um, you have a list of formal essay rules, things like using third person rather than first and second person, and uh, so on and so forth. So make sure that you are following all of those other formal essay rules, and we are going to call it good. Thanks for listening, and uh, go off and write a very good, strong literary analysis paper. <laughs>